you very much. Uh, so hi, my name is Kat Tamajan, and this talk is Hacking In-Group Bias for Fun and Profit. If you are not here for this talk, um, please go. If you are here for this talk, you're in the wrong spot. Um, wait, no, you're in the right spot. Oh, English, English is hard. I had a migraine this morning, so please forgive me. <laughs> All right, so I'm also known as Zarawi on most of the internet. My staff account on DreamWith is Miss Cat. I work for DreamWith Studios LLC, which is an independent community-based blogging platform that believes in privacy, accessibility, diversity, and freedom. Forked from the LiveJournal codebase in mid-2008, we have about a quarter of a million lines of code. Uh, we're co-owned by Denise Palucci and Mark Smith. About 50 or 60 active volunteers across various parts of the project. About two-thirds of those volunteers are women and about 65% never coded before they touched our project. My actual job is community and volunteer support. I mostly just interface between the users and the developers, point out bugs, handle end user documentation. I handhold for new volunteers, and I do a lot of community management, which means that I'm on IRC a lot. I answer questions. I'm a friendly face that's willing to talk to you if you have any questions. Uh, my experience, just in general, is I've been a nonprofit volunteer for 15 years with various organizations and a nonprofit volunteer management for five. I've been doing open source projects for about that same period of time, about five years, primarily DreamWith, a little bit of involvement with a few other projects. Um, I was the co-lead of support for three and a half years, and I got hired in 2013. So basically, I'm a professional people wrangler. Also an insurance agent, in case you need that. Um, <laughs> So general perceptions. Open source is perceived to be very insular. We're a very tight-knit community, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Tight-knit communities imply that there's a lot of support for everybody, but not always. So you have to be working on the project to actually work on the project. I know a lot of people who say that they need to get a foothold. They want to know somebody who's working on the project, who knows somebody who knows somebody. And it's these very tenuous community connections that get people into your project. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. So if you don't do things exactly right, somebody's going to come after you and say, no, you did that wrong. You're bad. You, that's terrible. You're a horrible person and a horrible programmer. And I don't want you on my project anymore. Now, most of us know that doesn't usually happen, at least with the projects that I've been involved with. But it does. It does happen. And that's why there's that perception. So fortunately, we can hack it. We have science. And I'm really excited about science because science is so cool. And brains. Brains, seriously brains, I don't, just brains. <laughs> so we're gonna talk a little bit about science words first, just to kind of give you a baseline familiarity with what we're gonna be talking about today. So the basic terminology we're looking at are in-groups versus out-groups. Your in-group can be defined as us, me, I. I am a woman, I am a support volunteer, I am a member of an open source community. I am a member of an open source community who gets paid. These are things that I can use to define my own in-group. You can also use other factors. So your race, your gender, sexual orientation, social connections. So I know D and Scud, and so therefore I am part of that social network. I'm part of that in-group. You can also use your coding ability. So I know how to program in Ruby. OK, so you're automatically part of the Ruby in-group. Um, you can also use shared experiences. So I walked here today. Or I took a taxi today. Or I'm from someplace very, very far away, and I had to travel a long way to get here. You can use all of those to define your in-group. So those I am statements will help you figure out where you are, if you actually need to think about it. Most people really don't because you just know. You'll walk into the hack lounge and be like, na, 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 bing, bing, bing. OK, I'm going to go sit over there, because I know those people. I'm part of that in-group. So an out-group is them, if in-group is us. So an out-group is any group to which we do not self-identify. It uses a lot of the same criteria, race, gender, sexual orientation, coding ability, social groups, anything along those lines. It can also be somebody who doesn't fit into all of your social groups or all of your categories. So a really good example for this particular conference is I am a member of an open source, a woman who's a member of an open source community. So that's my in-group. But a man who's part of an open source community wouldn't be part of my in-group as I self-identify it. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. 
So then you have in-group bias, which is what we're going to be looking at today and seeing how we can make our brains think that other people are actually part of our in-group when they're not. So when you treat members of your in-group preferen preferentially, that means that you have some in-group bias. It's mostly unconscious. Uh, very rarely does do you, you think, oh yes, of course they are part of my in-group, so I must treat them preferentially. I don't think anybody really does that. The bias really governs pretty much everything that we do. Who you eat lunch with, who you sit with downstairs, who you give projects to, who you ask for help from. That's what defines that in-group bias. And that's something you just need to be aware of in your daily life. And especially when you're working on projects where we have this idea that you have to be connected to someone. If you give somebody the idea that you're not connected to them, they're going to remember that, whether it's conscious or not. So in-group favoritism is positive feelings towards the in-group. We were just talking about that a second ago, where you know, I know Denise and Sarah. So I like Denise and Sarah. And they're super cool. Yes, I like you. Um, and they're, I have positive feelings towards them. And it means that I tend to think that they're better. Not necessarily consciously, but it's just kind of the way it works out. So if somebody, if I had a group of people, five, let's say I had five people, and there were four people I didn't know and somebody that I did know, and you asked me about the skills, if that skill set is something that the person I know has, or might have, or could possibly have, or at one point in the distant past indicated that they may possibly have, my brain is automatically going to associate them with being better at it. That's part of what marketing uses as getting your name out there. If you've seen the name before, you're going to remember it, and you're going to think that it's better, even if it's not necessarily any better. So on the opposite side of in-group favoritism is out-group derogation, so negative feelings towards the out-group. Basically, that they're worse, not as talented, they don't work quite as hard, they're just generally less good. Generally, these feelings are unfounded. Occasionally, they, they do have some basis in fact, but not generally. So now that we have the basic science words, we're going to talk about advanced science word. So minimal group paradigm. Does anybody know what that means without looking at the slide, which you already did, so never mind. <laughs> so basically, uh, minimal, group, minimal group paradigm is when individuals self-divide into meaningless groups based on the most tenuous connections. So you back there, you have pink hair. And you over there, you have pink hair. If you, we were to put you into a large group setting with people who had nothing in common with you other than the pink hair, you would form an in-group. You would find each other and recognize, oh yes, we both have pink hair, therefore we are part of this very tenuous in-group. And you think, well, pink hair doesn't really mean anything. The same color shirt doesn't have any real context to what you can do, but your brain doesn't realize that. It looks for those connections. When you talk to somebody brand new that you've never met before, the first questions are, how is your day going? Oh, your day is going well. So where are you from? Oh, you're from Massachusetts. I am too. Well, where in Massachusetts? Oh, I'm from Boston. Where in Boston? Oh, I'm from Cambridge. Oh, did you go to MIT? Why, yes, I did. And you have these connections. And the more points of connections, the stronger that association is going to be and the stronger that in-group is going to become. Now, interestingly, we have the four connections, right? But we're looking for where you went to college. Did you go to MIT? No but my brother's best friend's father did. Oh, okay, cool. Did you know him? And then you start, do you know, do you know so-and-so? Do you know this other person? Do you know this other person? The chances of them actually knowing that other person are so slim, but I can guarantee every single person in this room has at one time asked some random stranger if they know some other person that they know. It just happens, and that's why, because your, your mind automatically wants to seek out those connections. Basically, I call that the oh my god, me too connection. <laughs> um, whether it's actually there or not is a different story. So Frances this morning in her keynote mentioned that small talk's really important. Small talk's what allows us to make those connections. And so community building and the process of making an in-group, making your project be a cohesive in-group is crucial. It's absolutely crucial. It cannot be overlooked. So action items for making sure that your minimal group paradigm turns into less of a minimal group and turns into a significant group. You want to make sure you have a safe social space for your community. 
Um, a lot of projects have an IRC channel or some sort of chat function. You want to make sure you have a social aspect to that if you can. Uh, like for DreamWith specifically, we have DreamWith Dev, which is specifically for development work and very little social work. And then we have the main DreamWith chat channel, which is just for chat. And so that chat channel has people in it who have never written a line of code in their lives, don't really contribute to the project, but they're there being social because they are part of that in-group. So if your project does have a public IRC channel, try to make it nice. Make it be a warm, welcoming environment for people. You want to establish really clear community guidelines. So DreamWith has a DreamWith IRC code of conduct. It's linked right in the header of the, of the channel. And we can point to it and say, here are the things that we expect people in this group to do. Can you do them? Awesome. Welcome. You can't? Well, could you try? OK, cool. You can't try? Well, maybe there's another channel that would be a better fit for you. Thanks for stopping by. And making sure that we enforce that has been an ongoing project, and I think it's one we've been relatively successful at. Now, keep in mind, what works for DreamWith isn't going to work for everybody else. Everyone's going to have a slightly different take on this, but the general principles will still apply. You do want to review communications on a regular basis to make sure that people aren't acting like they're uncomfortable. So if you have a large group of people and one or two of them keep saying the same thing, like, that comment really rubbed me wrong. Please don't talk about that anymore. That makes me not feel good. You want to look at that and maybe reevaluate your community standards. Sometimes you'll change them, sometimes you won't, but at least take the time to do the review. Community behavior standards also should ideally self-enforce. You want to have enough people in that in-group who are like-minded, thinking along the same lines, that you don't have to do a whole lot of active moderation. If you have to do active moderation, you might want to reevaluate the way you've built your community and see if you can take that ship and turn it a different direction. It can also, oh, sorry, um, if your community is self-enforcing, then once it becomes unacceptable to do X, then X is going to happen less. Because peer pressure works in both directions. You can either pressure people to do good things or pressure them to do bad things. We're going to try to pressure people to do good things because we want to have a good, healthy, cohesive project. You also want to make sure that you have the conversation with people and make sure that you have it productively. So if somebody is consistently problematic, you want to pull them aside gently politely and say, hey, these things you're doing aren't OK. You don't want to immediately force them out because, hey, maybe they can change. They probably won't, just as a heads up, but they might. <laughs> People, leopards can't change their spots. But sometimes they can. They can put on a nice hat. Uh, <laughs> OK, we're going to go back to the migraine this morning. Um, and yeah. so. Another thing you want to do is to make sure that you're explicitly inviting people into your group. So DreamWith has a diversity statement where we specifically lay out the types of people that we are actively and explicitly inviting to come and join DreamWith. Not necessarily the development project, but DreamWith itself, our blogging platform. We want people who are not neurotypical, who are creative, who are not creative, who are of any race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, country of origin, planet of origin, I suppose, anything. We want you to come, and we lay those out explicitly. The diversity statement is at dreamwith.org slash, slash legal slash diversity. Uh, and you should go there if you have the opportunity and go take a look at it, because it really is extensive. And I would normally have a slide, but I don't. So we're just going to pretend I do. Um, hey, you. You very specifically, you, that person right there, I want you to come and be part of my project. It's going to be a lot more, in, no, like I'm actually serious. I would actually like you to come join DreamWith. <laughs> um, yes, you right there. That's going to have a more positive effect in whether that person actually does come and do a thing rather than, hey, you guys should just come volunteer with my project. OK, yay, everybody come. Pointing people out specifically makes them feel included because it tells them that they are part of an in-group. And that in-group gives them some connectivity. And connectivity makes your project go zoom. And that is really awesome. Another thing you want to make sure you're keeping an eye on is being inclusive. You don't want to exclude people just the same as you want to make sure you are including them. So don't talk smack about people or about the things that they've created. A particular project that 
or particular issue that DreamWith had way back in the beginning was that the person who wrote the beginnings of a lot of our code um, maybe wasn't the tidiest code writer um, or the sanest. It sometimes took a great deal of alcohol to understand exactly where he was going with his code, and so it became a running joke. It was written by Brad in his dorm room with BML. It was pointed out to us that that was really exclusionary, especially when we were a community that was trying to encourage new developers. We're trying to get them to come to our project and we're making fun of another guy who like built the framework that we're working off of, really? So we've stopped. We, stu we took a step back and we realized, hey, that's not okay. We're gonna stop and we changed our community standards. We turned our course. We went in a different direction and we haven't had really many problems with it since. Also, you wanna make sure you're doing things like this is a really nice patch. Thank you so much for contributing. I really appreciate it. There's a couple things I noticed. Uh, this part doesn't conform to our style guidelines. Here's a link. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. I really want to know about this. If you have anything I can help you with. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a lot better than, that sucks, rewrite it. Which one are you going to be a little bit more inclined to redo? The first one just in case you hadn't picked up on that. Um, <laughs> so you also don't want to write somebody off because of their gender, sexual orientation, race, disability, coding ability, or any one of a number of things. It's horrible, don't do it. Drives away new contributors, makes them feel not part of the group. They can't be part of the group if you're telling them specifically that they're not. Um, another thing, quick, don't use ableist language, don't use racist language. I really shouldn't have to say that in 2014. And I probably don't have to say it to you guys, but there's people on the internet who are going to watch this. So people on the internet, don't use racist, sexist, or ableist language. Thank you. Uh, listen, people on the internet are important too, OK? <laughs> um, another way to make your project welcoming is to use hacker schools uh, forbidding a false surprise. So <gasps> really? Huh, I didn't know that the sky was blue. Don't do that. It's stupid and it's also not very nice. And well actually statements because they're pedantic, they're bike shedding, and I just really, really, really don't like them at all. Um, another thing is don't say let me Google that for you if it's a really simple question because while you might automatically know the answer, the person who asked it probably did already look on Google and they already looked to see if they could find the answer. They might not have looked very hard but they did look and now they're asking for help. Don't chase them off because asking for help was really hard. You can try asking them specifically where they looked for answers or what they're getting stuck on. Walk through their process with them. Be proactive. Make them feel like they're important. Um, let's see here. So part of being part of an in-group is having jargon and having in-jokes. If, for example, I went and talked to my friend Jen, who I adore very dearly and I've known her forever and ever, we could have an entire conversation and we would both understand exactly what the other one was talking about and nobody else would have a single clue of what we were saying because there's not that shared context. So for an open source project, it's important to make sure you're documenting your culture. Make sure that anybody who's brand new, is, who's just coming in today, has a place to look and understand that shared context so that they can say, oh, okay, yeah, no, I get that. That's really funny. Good job. That was a really good joke, rather than just sort of sitting there and kind of being awkward and feeling excluded or left out. So DreamWith has a jargon page. Um, it has common language that we use within DreamWith. Uh, I don't, can't think of a specific example right now, but we just try to break those out and make sure that people understand what we're talking about when we say something that might be a little um, occlusive. The other thing is the end jokes. We have a QDB, a quotes database, that we have for our IRC channel. There's some that have been there for a really long time, and they've just sort of become part of the culture. You want to give people an in into that culture so that they can slip on their sheepskin coat and walk among you, and you won't necessarily notice that they haven't been there for a while. Um, one thing I have noticed is that when I've been away from IRC for a while and we have somebody new who's come in, I can tell how long they've been there by how quickly they've acclimated to the jokes and how quickly they can understand. And if I start seeing them making those same types of remarks and the same types of comments that everybody who's been there for a long time has been making, I usually don't notice that they're new. 
And that's exactly what you want. You want to trick your brain into thinking you already know these people. Uh, let's see here. Oops. So intergroup aggression. You have social group A and social group B. We do this, they do that. You want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on what those social groups are. Uh, there was a study, oh, we're going to talk about the study in just a second, sorry. Um, having something that will frequently self-identify or having a group that frequently self-identifies as better or being more efficient or more of something is going to contribute to aggressive behavior. Whether it's necess or necessarily aggressive or if it just happens to coincidentally be aggressive, it kind of depends on the situation. So for an example, having a common or shared experience will cause group bonding. For dream width, open beta was a huge group bonding experience for us. Um, so open beta is when we first open to the public. We had been kind of ramping up for a while, and then all of a sudden, we opened up the invite codes. Anybody who was in the general public could join our site. It was like a fire hose. I still have nightmares about the, like that week. It was both the most amazing experience I've had and one of the worst. It was, it was scary. I mean, you come in, and there's all these people, and everything's flying, and nobody knows what's going on. And then all of a sudden, I'm in charge. What? I'm in charge? OK, well, we're going to go forward and move, do a thing, I guess. And you have to kind of go. And it's scary. But a year later, we got icons that said, I survived open beta. For the volunteers who'd been around, I survived. We survived. And that formed a cohesive group. And a lot of those people are still around. Not all of them, but they are. You can have uh, a common enemy that'll unite a group as well. So that one person. Oh my god, did you hear about that guy over there? And he did that one thing that one time. And oh my gosh, can you even imagine? I know I've heard that. and that gives you a way to talk to somebody else and have them say, oh my gosh, yeah, no, totally, you're totally right. You've found those connections. You've bonded together. So when you have that type of aggression or have that type of bonding, it automatically makes you want to be a little bit more aggressive. Like, well, my project did this one other thing. Did you know that? What did your project do? And maybe not with quite the head like Bobby thing, but you can kind of imply that, I suppose. Um, now, that aggression can be good. It can get other people interested in your project if you do it in a positive way. So, hey, did you know that we did this thing and it was really cool? Oh, yeah, no, that is totally really cool. I'm going to go over to your project. That can get more people in, involved and interested, but not necessarily. Sometimes it can drive people off. It can create these intergroup aggressions, and those intergroup aggressions are not really positive. Um, there was a study that was done that showed perceived intergroup conflict of interest is the best predictor of aggression. So if you set up your project to be like, oh, well, we are not this thing, or we are so much better than this thing, that's the stronger that that setup is, the stronger that aggression is going to be towards that other group. And we're a really small community comparatively to the larger tech community, and it's important to make sure that we're not fighting each other, because fighting is not really super fun. Um, so they do this, and we do that. And therefore, they are the enemy. Uh, it can happen within an in-group also. So if you have two people who want to approach the same project from completely different sides, and then you get a couple other people who are like, oh, yeah, no, I totally think we should do it this way. And then the other people are like, oh, no, we should totally do it this way. That creates in-groups within your in-group, and those can have aggression too. And that can rip your project apart. It can rip it apart fast. So keep an eye on it and try to shut it down when you can. Um, the best way to do that is to find commonalities. So to look at the solutions that you have both come up with independently and see if you can find those connections again. Because that will re-knit your community together and everyone will have a mutually satisfactory conclusion. Uh, let's see here. Now. If you can, sorry, if you can find points of reference within the group, which is the target of your aggression, they stop being a faceless blob and become people. So you reach out to that other group. When you're reaching out to the other group, you have to find a shared identity. Uh, there was a study that was done in 2010 
that I thought was really fascinating. So I'm just going to read you a little excerpt out of the, um, the article blob. So when their shared identity as Americans was made salient, Democrats and Republicans experienced less threat and more positive outgroup attitudes. Intergroup threat acted as a mediator of the relationship between common identity and outgroup attitudes, suggesting that a common identity increases positive outgroup attitudes by first reducing the intergroup threat. So if you can find, well, we have one. We have the open source community. We can say, you know, we should stop fighting. We're all part of the same group. Even though your project's doing this and my project's doing this, let's stop fighting together and unite together as the open source community. It's just, I thought that was really fascinating. So there you go. You can also use something like women's advocacy. We have a lot of women here. We just want to make sure that we're all going in the same direction. Go team. Uh, outgroup homogeneity. So we're all different, but they're all the same. And that kind of goes back to that point I was just talking about with the outgroups where they're kind of turned into this faceless blob, this monster that's sort of gelatinous and hanging out in the back corner. You don't really have a face applied to it. With the outgroup members, you say, um, actually, let me back up here. So when you say they're alike, we're all different. Or you could say like what they have the little pins that high schoolers tend to put on their bag where it says, you laugh because I'm different, but I laugh because you're all the same. We're not. And every single person in this room could have that pin on their bag and they could all truly believe it, but it's not the truth because we really are all different. And so um, there was a study that was done in 2012 showing that people are more likely to include their own group members as individuals than people in an out group. So you recognize the people that you know and the people that are part of your in group as actual humans. And you don't necessarily do that with anybody else. And your subconscious doesn't recognize them as individuals either. If you look at a mall, you walk through the mall and there's people in your way, you say, oh my gosh, those are such, they're, they're idiots. They're all, they're all idiots. They're all, all. That's the word you're looking for. If you try, like if you say that, you're lumping them all into the same group. And they're really not. Maybe somebody's just having a bad day or maybe they have a bad hip and can't get out of the way. Um, it also affects the way that your emotions work about other people. Ultimately, many forms of discrimination and bias may develop not because outgroups are hated, but because positive emotions such as admiration, sympathy, and trust are reserved for the in-group. So it's not necessarily that you hate everybody else, you just don't like them. And there's a difference. So hate is an active emotion. You have to actively hate or actively dislike. If I just don't, I don't like you. It's not that I don't like you, but I just, I don't care. You're over there. You're doing something. Oh, that's terrible. That thing that happened to you, that's really terrible. I don't know and I really don't care. I have more important things to do because I have individuals within my in-group that I'm paying attention to. If you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. It takes up a lot more mental energy to, carry, to care about strangers than it does to care about the people that you know. So action items for this out-group, like keeping an eye on the faceless blob. So if you're capturing yourself saying something like, well, they do things this way, then check yourself before you wreck yourself because you're, you're faceless blobbing them, which I think we're going to turn into a term. If you're faceless blobbing them, then you need to take a look and back up and say, okay, nope, they're individuals. They're individuals and let's take a look at their individual motivation because very rarely will the whole group do something absolutely in, uh, cohesively. Also identify it, figure out why you're saying they, rather than using their specific names. Or if you're just using it as a collective term, make sure you're identifying that it's not actually a collective, it's a bunch of individuals, which are similar terms, but they're not the same. And then also be aware of the boogeyman syndrome. So when you say, well, Google is doing this thing over here, I'm sorry if there's any Googlers in the room, by the way. Um, well, Google's doing this thing, and they're just terrible, and they're the absolute worst. You know, there's people behind that computer screen, and maybe you should remember that there's people behind that computer screen, because unfortunately, computers aren't sentient. And they're individuals, and just remember to recognize that. I keep harping on that subject, and I'm going to keep doing it, because it's really important, and it's something that everybody forgets. That's why we have internet trolls, is because they forget that we're people. Or they remember that they're people, and they're just awful. So let's talk about imposter syndrome, speaking of internet trolls. So imposter syndrome, cognitive bias, and you. Your contributor's negative self-esteem can and will affect your project. 
So imposter syndrome is the constant feeling that any minute everyone around you will find out that they're or find out that you're faking it. Has anyone ever felt like that? Because, yeah, I'm, mm -hmm, yeah. Like right now, that whole thing with that, yeah, that's kind of going on. So this can make even the most experienced people question their abilities. Encouragement and positive reinforcement can really help combat this. So just keep an eye out for when people are saying things about themselves or acting in a way that you wouldn't normally expect them to. And there's not a cure. You'll hear people say that there's a cure for imposter syndrome and they are lying. There is not a cure for imposter syndrome, there's only treatment. And the treatment is keeping an eye out for it, making sure that people are recognizing those negative behaviors and correcting them where they can. So an individual's poor opinion of themselves can and will have a significant effect on your project. Low self-esteem subjects rated both the in-group and the out-group out -group more negatively than they did self-high esteem high self-esteem subjects. So if your project has people who are of low self-esteem, they're going to think less of your project overall. Whether it's, it's cognizant or not, they're still gonna think that because, well, for example, I don't like this project that I'm a part of because I'm not very good. So if I'm not very good and they're accepting me and they think I'm great, then clearly they might not be as good as I think that they are. So action items. First of all, identify. We just talked about that a couple seconds ago. Uh, words you want to look out for are, I'm not good at this, I can't do this, I suck, I have no purpose, why am I here? You want to discourage that negative self-talk if you can, um, or at least just identify it, call it out when it's an appropriate situation to do so. Don't necessarily do it in public. Um, now, I, on the other hand, threaten to send excessively cheerful Avengers pictures to my friends who are saying bad things about themselves. Sometimes <laughs> it works, sometimes it doesn't, um, but sometimes it does. Something else that I've started doing in another uh, community that I'm a part of is a 3-2-1 system. So a 3-2-1 system is when my uh, medieval manuscript illumination group takes a picture that they just drew or painted or whatever, and they say three things they like about it, two things they don't like about it, and one constructive thing that they can do to improve for the future. And what that does is it places the positive things first. It makes them think about the things that they enjoy about that item that they just created. It does allow for some self-criticism and evaluation in a positive context, so it gives them an outlet for that negative feeling inside of themselves when they're considering their own personality or their own talent. But it also sets an action for or item, an action item uh, for self-guided improvement. It's not necessarily something that I'm going to give to them and say, well, you should work on this. They're finding within themselves what, what direction they want to be headed. So you also just want to make sure that when you're looking for that imposter syndrome that you're not putting undue stress on committers. So be understanding of other things that are going on in their lives. Oh, that's the wrong slide. Um, there we go. Be aware of what else is going on. So there was a, um, a study done by Columbia Spectator that said, Aaron says masochism is the perfect way to describe the culture in computer science, pushing yourself to the extreme and getting awesome stuff done. But that's not really true. That's kind of the cultural perception, but that's not actually what happens. What actually happens is you put a lot of pressure on somebody who's got a lot of other things going on, like a real job or family or a real job and family and health issues and this and that and the other thing and so many other things that are going on, they're not going to you know, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and buckle on through 99.9% .9 of the time. What they're going to do is they're going to freak out and drop your project and say, nope, 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 nope. They're going to nope across the nope to puss ocean and they're just going to go away. They're not coming back because you've scared them off because it's too much. So be understanding and say, yeah, no, that's totally fine. I understand that. And you can have a culture that values consistency, but you can also have a culture that understands that people are people and they have lives outside of the computer. Um, when those behaviors start, when they start resenting the project, when they start finding other things to do, when they start getting frustrated and lashing out, just keep an eye on people and check in with them. And in a context that doesn't have anything to do with the project, just say, hey, I was thinking about you today. Are you okay? Or you know, I haven't seen you on IRC in a while. Is everything going all right? Or a folder full of cat pictures, which also works um, and says pretty much the same thing. So just check on them 
and make sure everything's peachy to go. All right. So other cool stuff that I figured out or found out when I was researching for this talk, and I do have a bibliography, so if anybody wants it, just, I saw your eyes go wide. <laughs> um, yes, I have tasty, tasty citations. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, so when, I forgot exactly where I was going with that. Um, women stick together. So there's been some studies that have been done um, about pervasive in-groups, and literally I could write 100 pages 100 pages on this. I'm like so hand flaily and excited about it. So in tech culture, we have a lot of women-centric initiatives. So we have the OPW, we have the ADA initiative, we have Girls Who Code, we've got a lot of other things going on, including individual projects that specifically encourage women to contribute. And that really encourages women to stay involved in technology and to foster a community of support. And I think that is so awesome. It is so cool and I feel welcomed and I feel important and I feel part of that in-group. I feel like I'm there and I've got something, a place where I can belong. And I think that's what a lot of people want is a place where they can go to belong. So I was looking into just women in technology in general for this talk and I found that there actually is a psychological background for why this tends to happen. So there were four experiments conducted in 2004 that confirmed that women's automatic in-group bias is remarkably stronger than men's. Women want to stick together. Four, four different studies. Do you know how hard it is to get four studies to actually agree with each other? It doesn't happen, like ever. And there were four of them that all said exactly the same thing. So women as an in-group are inherently more cohesive and are more likely to self-identify as an in-group, whether you self-identify as a woman or I'm not sure how exactly that works, so I'm just going to place that out there. Um, I have some theories, I guess. So my own personal theory is that the technological community default is male. And so when the default is male and you're not male, that places you in an out group. And that out group cohesively becomes an in group. So that's something called othering. And if you go onto the Geek Feminism Wiki, they have a really great page on othering and the othering concept. So basically it's us, them, and everyone else. Women tend to be the everyone else. There's not a place for us. We don't have a ticky box. We're not, you know, we're not this, we're not that, we're something else. And so being that something else has given us something to be cohesive about and to come together and to be really proactive about making sure that other people who are feeling like they're left out and they don't have a place, they have some place to go. I know that's something that's been really important for me. I know it's been important for Dream With as a whole, is making sure that women can feel safe and feel comfortable. And there's psychology behind it, and that's just really exciting. Um, it also gives you a common enemy. So everyone who's not an other is over there. And so that's who you're looking at. So you have your in-group here, right? and that's the others, and then we have everyone who's not an other, and it flips the tables. It makes us so that we're the, we're the ones who are excluding, which isn't necessarily good, but it gives that cohesiveness. Um, let's see, I had a note here about if everyone's a white middle-aged male, that makes it difficult for people who are not white middle-aged men to find connections because they can't be part of the in-group. So women look for other people like me, for women like me, for gendered or non-gendered or colored or oriented like me, and representation leads to an in-group, leads to comfort, leads to folks sticking around, and all it takes is one person to do it. And now it is Q&A time with Mermaid knocking people over with science. So yay. Uh, did anyone? <laughs> I love Tumblr. She has the best collection of animated GIFs from Tumblr ever. I spend so much time on Tumblr. It's really bad. I wish I could get paid for it, but I can't. So. <laughs> Um, actually, hey boss. <laughs> okay, um, did anyone have any questions or commentary or discussions or whatever? Oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, hats, hair ties, anybody? Yes. That really is up to you how you want to handle somebody who's got some of the connections. It only takes one. 
it takes one connection for them to feel like, or to, for them to theoretically have some sort of a connection to the in-group. More connections are good, but if somebody has pink hair and the other person, I'm just going to use that as an example, sorry. Um, if someone's got pink hair and this other person has pink hair, that can form a connection. And that can very occasionally be enough to keep somebody around, not necessarily. So what you want to do in that particular situation is to try and find more connections and maybe find out what they consider to be their own in-groups and what they want to be connected to and see if you can find other ways to get them close or change your project a little bit, change the scope and be like, okay, so we're doing this, you're doing that. Maybe they can meet here. Why don't we head over in that direction? It doesn't work for everybody, but it can work for some people. Sarah? Yeah. How do you prevent, if, if, the, the awareness, how do you make sure that there's awareness to prevent any toxicity in the I think the first thing to make sure that you don't create another othering situation is to just be aware of it. Make sure that when you're looking at your community that you're also keeping in mind these other things that are going on and also keep an eye on your history. So know where you came from and just be aware of going back there again because clearly you left for some reason. And you don't want to have this peachy like, oh, in the golden times of blah, 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 it was wonderful and now we're here and it's terrible. Because that's not really the case. Generally, things get better and you want to keep in mind why you left in the first place. Uh, does that kind of answer your question? I think just being aware of it, really, and bringing it up and talking about it rather than just having it be something that's off in the misty past uh, will kind of keep things moving forward. Anyone? Oh, yes, and then you. Well, and I think, okay, so just to restate, did everyone hear what she said about three? Okay, so she was talking about how the three, two, one seems to be more of an internal thing and how you share that internal thing into an external thing. Is that kind of accurate? Sure. Okay, um, so with the three, two, one, that's something I use in a group that's not dream with, but within the tech culture, you can take that and I just completely forgot what the question was. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so if you have something that's internal, we were just talking a little bit earlier about how you have those negative self-talk can lead to bad results for your community. It's the same general concept. What happens for the individual will also eventually happen for the larger group. So if you can increase people's awareness of their own failings or their own faults or the only things that they need to be working on or the things that they're doing really well, that will eventually bolster up your community and make everything a little bit stronger. Um, I, within the community that I do the 321 with, that's actually an external thing. So people aren't doing that automatically yet. I just started it maybe, maybe six months ago. There's only about 30 of us who are doing it actively right now. But usually we have to be reminded. And we post something up and we're like, oh, this is terrible. And, the edge on this is really wobbly and I didn't do a good job and blah, blah, blah. And then somebody else comes in and says, hey, give me your three, two, ones. Hey, do this thing. Hey, you're awesome. Hey, do you remember how cool you are and how important you are? Here, tell me three nice things about yourself right now. And then you can tell me about the two bad things that you did and then you can give me one thing you want to improve. And that can put it into a positive connotation. Does that kind of make sense? I'm kind of off in la la land, my green land. Um, so. Yes. When you have somebody who is um, mired in negative self-talk and negative self-critique, mm -hmm. using this system forces them to reframe it so that they're thinking at least partially positively as well. Yes, it's a reframing. So if you have a picture right here and you're looking at it from here, you turn and look at it from here, and it's going to look different than it does. Any other? Oh, you had a question? Mm 
Mm -hmm. No, in terms of organization, it's like hacking into your bias and sort of completely acknowledging that that's not a good thing that could exist. And I'm wondering if you or anyone really has had any success in trying to hack uh, people's awareness of in group bias so that they can even start working on it. So, hacking other people's awareness of in group bias so they yeah. can kind of figure out what's going on and maybe stop doing that thing? Yeah. Um, talking about it, make it public. Um, if you want, I'd be happy to send you my slides afterwards. Just drop me an email at zarwe at dreamwith.org or miscat at dreamwith.org. And I will send you my stuff and you can post it up and be like, hey, I went to this really cool talk. Maybe everyone should go and read this. And maybe some people will read it and be like, oh, this is stupid. And some people will read it and be like, hey, I'm doing that thing. I'm going to stop that now. Um, unfortunately, there's not really a way you can force other people to change their behaviors. I know, right? <laughs> I wish, I wish, but unfortunately, I'm really not smart enough to be in control of everyone. So as much as I wish that they would just do my bidding all the time, I'm not D. That was negative self-talk. Oh, three nice things about myself. Um, I have uh, fingernails right now, which is very exciting. My hair looks fantastic, and I did a good job on my makeup. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, go ahead. And then you and then you. If you happen to, to um, be able to discover points of connection that, that um, the person doing the excluding and the person who they're excluding have in common. Mm. You may be able to connect to those people. You you may be able to say, hey, you know, um, that person also went to MIT and likes knitting. I'm us we're using you as an example today, apparently. I don't have to care. That is actually something that a lot of uh, people do very instinctively. Like when you're in the middle of the flame war and somebody wants to come in and try and like ease the flame war, it's really common for somebody to say, guys, we're all working on the same project here. We all have the same goals. You know, don't let this uh, get to you. And you know, people are trying to reframe that uh, uh, in-groupness. And I think they're doing it instinctively in a lot of cases. Which is really great. Also, uh, peer pressure works both ways. So if they're pressuring other people to be biased in that direction, you can kind of become a bigger person, like puff yourself up and put on like your fancy headdress and go out and be like, I like this other thing and try to be the change you want to see in the world. We'll just go with that. Um, did you have a question? And then. I can definitely see that. It definitely is. Uh, codifying the jargon and making it exclusionary is something that we try not to do. Our purpose isn't to necessarily say, when you're talking about this, this, or this, you have to use these terms. It's more just providing a dictionary. So if we have somebody new who comes in and says, what do you mean when you say football field? That makes no sense in this context. We can say, oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Here's a really cool story that we have from this other time. And then they can go in and, and learn about it themselves and be able to put on that code.